Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host here. And my guest today is a yoga instructor and a knitter, Liza Laird. Hi, Liza. Hello. So you also an author of a book called Yoga of Yarn, and I have it right here. And okay. I've been reading it. And it's very interesting because you talk a lot about how you discovered both knitting and yoga and meditation, and you com- found a way to combine the two of them. Tell me a little bit like your story of how you started knitting and when yoga entered your life. Yeah. Um, so I first learned to knit when I was about eight years old. My mom taught me. My mom is an absolutely amazing knitter, and I'm so thankful that she's taught me this and shared it with me um, and started me so young. Um, I remember my first scarf was like a weird triangle with lots of holes and very funny, but I, from then on, just absolutely loved it. Um, and my mom's also the one who introduced me to yoga. Um, I started meditation in school. Um, there was a you know teacher who liked meditation and he offered that. And my mom had taken me to some yoga classes. Um, and so I always liked both. Um, but over the years, as I practiced them more, I um, realized how much I believe that they're, they are woven together. Um, and, uh, out of that love start, I started leading knitting and yoga retreats. Um, and so the book is kind of a knitting and yoga retreat in, in a compact form. So you can have it at home. (laughs) Right. Well, in your book, you were like at the very beginning, basically you were telling the story of, you going through the breast cancer treatment and how both yoga and knitting basically kept you sane yeah uh, and you know helped you through that Mm -hmm. like do you feel like knitting is as meditative as yoga and like a lot of people sort of joke that knitting is the new yoga Mm -hmm. like what's it for you like where do you find more peace for yourself You know, I think that it depends on the day. And I think that's why I love the idea of yoga and knitting um, together. It's not that you have to do them exactly at the same time. It's that they both can provide that meditative, soothing, relaxing nature. And if you practice them both regularly, um, depending on what you need in a moment, um, you can find that meditative state in either act of, you know, um, you could sit down and just meditate without knitting, or you can grab your knitting and turn it into a meditation. Um, not all knitting is meditative. Um, there are moments where it's not, but, um, you can enjoy that meditation from it. If you are practicing, um, if you want to practice it that way. Well, to me, like mm-hmm. I've tried a couple yoga classes, right? I'm like a total beyond be- beginner, basically when yeah. it comes to yoga, And to me, that wasn't meditative at all. That was like sort of hard. And I saw like people who were like twice my age doing Mm -hmm. things that I could not even imagine were doable, right? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I was struggling with the simplest things there. Do you think like with um, knitting, it's the same thing? Like you have to be kind to yourself when it comes to learning something new? Yes, a hundred percent. You need to be kind to yourself, no matter what you're trying to do. Um, you know, be learning brioche for the first time, or doing your first steak, um, or doing your first yoga class. What I find um, people find challenging about attempting to start a yoga practice is um, they're envisioning that they have to take an hour and a half yoga class and they have to be able to stand on their head and do stuff like that. And what I'm trying to promote with yoga of yarn is that. Yoga is sitting still. Um, Yoga can be stretching side to side. It doesn't have to be um, turning yourself into a pretzel. And and that's really what I had learned from going through breast cancer and why I leaned on yoga and knitting, because there's a way to adapt it to whatever situation you're in. So when I was going through treatment, I didn't have the energy or physical mobility to do anything that I used to do. Cause I, I used to be an instructor in New York city. I taught at, um, Equinox and yoga works. And, you know, I was always upside down on my head most of the time. Um, and then when I'm going through treatment, um, I lost the ability to do that. I had to really slow down 
and barely move. Um, but I still was able to practice yoga. And and that might have been just me laying flat on the ground breathing. Um, but that's still yoga. And knitting, knitting a garter stitch scarf, that is still knitting. Even it's not, you know, as elaborate as maybe a brioche, but um it's learning to do either one at whatever stage you're at. And being kind to yourself and open to the idea that it's really hard in the beginning and you're, there are going to be hard days and easy days, you know? Right. Well, you also sort of talk about how it's building this um, routine, right? Like that you don't have to do it for an hour and a half every day that you just like allocate five minutes to it. And if five minutes a day is too much, allocate five minutes a week, but just like keep consistent. Yeah. Do you find it's the same? Like when... When people think about trying something new, they mm-hmm. are all scared of like the unknown of it. Mm-hmm. They're thinking, oh, we'll have to like do this and we'll have to learn these techniques and we have to learn all of that. Do you yeah. think like this approach of like you going into unknown, you don't necessarily need to understand how it's going to work out. It just like just allocate some time to it and eventually it's going to all click together. Do you think it's like also common between knitting and yoga? Yes, totally. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think of the first time I learned brioche, for example, uh, I was scared of of tackling it. And I think a lot of people are. Um, And so I just let myself do two rows a day for a very long time. And then all of a sudden it clicked and it's like my absolute favorite stitch pattern. Um, And I have a very close friend right now who's just getting into knitting and she's too nervous to knit on her own. Um, and so it's slowly, slowly coming together. Um, my mom actually has been enlisted to be her, uh, knitting, knitting support partner because they live closer together than I do. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, it's jumping into the unknown and having faith that it eventually will work out, even if it doesn't feel like it in the, in the immediate moment. Well, tell me like a little bit about the idea of retreats, how you decided to do it. What was it like, like to start that first retreat? How did it go? So I actually, um, when I first graduated from college, I was working in marketing in New York City. And I had, you know, a nice nine to five job that I ended up doing for like 80 hours a week instead of, <laughs> instead of the 40 I hours know. that, you know, um, and I kind of was driving myself crazy. Um, but, you know, after work, I would find my yoga classes and I would do my knitting. Um, and then finally I was like, oh my God, why am, why am I putting myself through this? I was crying way too much. (laughs) And I decided to quit my job and become a yoga instructor. And I started, um, leading yoga retreats because I love to travel. Um, I had, I had grown up traveling and I loved to see the world and I wanted, um, to help other people do that. Um, and in a wellness perspective, so be it travel with yoga, you know? So my first retreat actually happened to be in Peru. Um, and I brought a group of people down there and it was really lots of fun. And I was like, you know, I brought my knitting with me and I was like, I wish this was a knitting and yoga retreat. And then I happened to go on a retreat with another teacher that I, um, that was my mentor in Vermont. And I just absolutely fell in love with this location, uh, good commons in Plymouth, Vermont. And it's, you know, I walked in, I felt like I was enveloped in a warm hug and there was this beautiful fireplace with cozy couches. And I was like, I need to sit here and just knit for the entire weekend and I'll sneak off and do a little yoga. Um, and so I started, uh, leading these knitting and yoga retreats. And, um, I will reference my mother a lot because she's, been a big influence on me and I had forced her to come on the retreat. Well, I didn't force her. She loves to come Mm -hmm. on every one of my trips. Uh, but I had her come on the retreat because although at that time, like 15 years ago, I, you know, had been knitting for a long time already, but I wasn't confident enough that I could help people if they had knitting mistakes or something. Um, so I had my mom come to support me in that. Um, and now she just gets to come and enjoy and knit and relax on the trips. But um, in the beginning, I was kind of putting her to work. <laughs> well, um, I mean, when you think about people coming to that retreat, right? I mean, to me, that sounds like a lot of pressure. Like, correct me, right? Um, you have to be 
a yogi of some sort and you have to be a neater like and both of them at the same time like how do you can find those people and how do you convince people that it's actually for them so i find that there are a lot more people who knit and practice yoga than you'd think <laughs> and like both and i also find that sometimes people who are brand new to knitting but really like yoga come and then there are people who really um you know like yoga and kind of barely knit who come so it's a combination of both and the thing i love about the retreats is it's completely like choose your own adventure so um I make the cl- I make the yoga classes available to all levels from absolute beginner to advanced um, and the knitting too. So it's people come for the, the camaraderie. Um, we have the majority of the people who come on the retreats, um, like half of them have been on it like five of my trips um, every year, just come back. And then the new ones are just really excited to see what it's all about. And uh in the end, a lot of times it's more that people are having conversations around the dinner table and knitting when they want and kind of coming to a few yoga classes. And I'm also not upset if somebody leaves the yoga class early. So, you know, they might come like, oh, 20 minutes is all I need today, you know, because usually the class is like an hour, hour and a half, or they'll sneak off. So it's it's more that um I try to make it be inclusive and for everyone. And you can also make the weekend, whatever, well, long weekend, it's a four day trip, whatever you want it to be. Um, And that's kind of what I try to express in the book as well. Like you don't have to do everything that I say in the book. It's more, even if you just take one thing and find peace and ease from it, it's a, it's a great, I think a great benefit um, to your life. (laughs) So talking about like pieces of that book, Yep. There are some uh, instances when you talk about, like you always go between yoga and knitting, right? So like you're talking about the beginner's mindset that mm-hmm. when we are children and we're learning some new skill, we're not intimidated by that and we're going like open, open-minded open and we're just enjoying the process and how like if we try to implement the same as adults, mm-hmm. we'll actually enjoy more and learn more because fears are the, what stops us from learning, right? Yeah. But you also talk about like, letting go of your stash mm-hmm. and when I read that my heart skipped a couple of beats and I was like no but but I like my stash right well tell me more about it like why would be organizing your life with mm-hmm. the yoga principles in mind be helpful for neaters So uh, when it comes specifically to that stash uh, reference and why I think that that you know that is another example of like taking something with a grain of salt and be like, nope, I that's not for me. I'm not going to do it. Um, and it's just more to offer a perspective. Um, so like when we talk about the stash and giving away, um, one reason I enjoy doing that sometimes is because then the next time I go to a yarn shop, I'm like, oh, I just gave one skein away. I can buy five more today. You know, it's 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 more like a silly thing that I do for myself for um a piece of mind. Um, but it's also that, um, I like to think of it as like the reason I have this yarn wall is so I can see what I have. This is not all that I have, like behind it are drawers and drawers full of yarn and knits and stuff, but it's more, um, to kind of just go through and acknowledge what, what you have rather than, um, moving forward without consciousness. Um, and with the beginner's mind approach, um, you know, the idea is like, yes, you can have fear and trepidation, but don't let it stop you. Like, like you can be like, oh, I'm too scared to start brioche or I'm too nervous to try a down dog. And if you acknowledge that, but you still try it, you know, that's, I think the exciting thing, um, of the self-awareness really is what, um, I like to be all about because I think that if we're more aware of ourselves with our yoga or our practice in daily life, then our knitting can be even more exciting because we can actually work on projects that we love rather than like, you know, I've, I've experienced it myself where 
a project takes forever because maybe I'm not enjoying it because I didn't actually want to knit it or, you know, not going along with what other people want to do. Um, you know, if you love knitting shawls and only want to knit shawls, then just stick with the, with the shawls, you know, um, or me, I'm, I really love a cowl. I'm constantly making cowls, um, that kind of thing. So it, it's, the book is more about trying to bring up ideas of what kind of self-awareness you can have and how when we have that self-awareness, it can just be a little bit more fun um, to do the things that we absolutely love. Well, after you wrote this book, right? I mean, I'm sure like when you talk to somebody or when you write something, it sort of clarifies things for you as well, because mm -hmm. like it's one thing when you know something, it's another thing when you put it on paper, it suddenly becomes like, or like I actually didn't think about it this way, but this is what it is, right? So yeah. after you wrote this book, mm -hmm. do you think you became a different knitter and a different person? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I wouldn't say different. I just think it clarified things a little bit more um, in way how I expressed um myself and my teachings, what I like to share with people. Um, but it, it really is just, um, it's how I kind of approach my day to day life. Um, and it's a way for me to share that with other people who also enjoy the aspects of yoga and knitting. Right. Well, you know how, um, like when you're in marketing, right, you have a, your business degree. So you're coming to the marketing job as a professional mm -hmm. with yoga you have your certifications mm -hmm. with knitting there is no such a thing basically you just like okay you knitted most of your life but that's about all the schooling of it right there is no the stamp of professionalism unless mm -hmm. you're going to some like specific program for that mm -hmm. when you write when you're teaching uh, knitting when you're writing a book about it when you're writing patterns as a designer do you ever doubt yourself? Do you ever get the imposter syndrome of like, do I actually know all of that? Um, you know, it's it's funny that you say that because I definitely went through that when I was writing. I was concerned about that, um, you know, but uh, I strongly believe that if you're writing and uh, about something, if you actually do those things on a daily basis and live your life by, by knitting or practicing yoga, that is one of the greatest teachers and educations you can have. Um, I, you know, for knitting, I, uh, yes, I, I learned when I was eight and I've knit for many years, but I also am going through the master knitter program with TKGA. Um, and I've completed level two, I would be doing level three right now, but I just had a baby. So I have a two month old plus my two other children. So I don't have that much time on my hands. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I did have a sweet fern hat in pom pom magazine. Um, and with the yoga, you know, I did my 500 hour teacher training with yoga works. I did over a thousand hours with um, Phoenix Rising Yoga Therapy. Um, and from all of my teachers who have been doing this from for many more years than I have, um, they always say, like, as long as you have your own personal practice and you actually live what you're talking about, that can be just as powerful. Well, when Nita's like, I know that. I when I knit I'm sort of obsessive knitter like I lose myself in knitting and I forget to get up and stretch and have that drink of water and all that things like I'm totally in the zone of yeah knitting. Mm -hmm. how what's your advice to knitters out there like how do you pace yourself how do you break it into parts how do you re like remind yourself to get up and do something Yes. I mean, I, I used to be that knitter who didn't get up and move. Um, but then, you know, life happened and I, that couldn't, it didn't work for me anymore. Cause my body started to tell me like, you need to move <laughs> and get up and you need that water. Um, but, uh, what I would say is you have to find something that works for you. And what I find works for me, uh, is I set a timer with my phone. That's one thing. Um, if you have a pet, you can kind of let them be your reminder of when it's time to get up 
and and go. Um, and you don't need to necessarily stand up and take your break for a solid 20 minutes, but um, you need to move just even for one minute can can make a difference. Uh, one thing I like to do also, if I don't feel like setting a timer or one of my children hasn't already interrupted me, um, I usually set a row limit, right? So I'm like, okay, I'm only allowed to do 20 rows, let's say, and then I have to take my break. Um, or I need to get through this entire chart. And once I get through that entire chart, so you can kind of, before you start your project, set up your limits um, as a reminder, but it's totally easy to completely forget that. And three hours can go by and you're like, okay, that hasn't happened to me in a few years, but three hours can go by and you're like, oh my God, I haven't moved once. And at that point, the key is to not worry about it and simply stand up and take your break then and be like, okay, next time I'm going to try to take my break after 30 minutes instead. Um, and then eventually it becomes a habit. It's more learning to acknowledge it. And then eventually it, it becomes a habit as you go. Well, what's your recommendation? Like when you do take that break, yep. would it be like some specific exercises should it, like what would be a good break for knitting to reset yourself so let's pretend you've been knitting for 30 minutes maybe even three hours and you just need a little break uh, your body needs to move a little bit this is a very short practice that i like to do uh, after i've knit for a little while just to get the blood flowing the first thing i do is stand up so I stand up and I shake out my hands and I kind of move from side to side a little bit. Just again, get the blood flow, take some deep breaths and get my system moving, okay? Doesn't have to be big movements, but it is just a tiny bit of movement. I then, if I've been sitting in a chair, I turn the chair to face me. I like, and even if I'm not sitting in a chair, I find a chair um, because I then like to do a supported downward facing dog. This is a nice high chair, so I've got a little bit of space um, to create with my spine. I'm gonna place my hands onto the back of the chair, walk my hips back and sway my hips from side to side. And this allows me to get a little bit of length in my spine. My head is relaxed, my neck is relaxed. I can kind of rotate from side to side and I let my knees bend a little bit. And take some nice deep breaths here. And then walk back up and shake out the hands. Okay, let's try that one more time. Supported downward facing dog. You place your hands onto the back of the chair. You can always put it on the seat of the chair for right now. I like, I'm liking the, the a little bit more height um, because I haven't, I've been, I had actually knit a little while ago and my shoulders are feeling pretty tight. So this is a nice way to ease into it. So I walk my hips back, nice long spine. My hips are right over my, ankles and then walk back up and shake out the hands so that supported down dog you could stay in for one breath five breaths or ten breaths whichever feel you feel like you can get nice length in your spine and then since we've been sitting for a while knitting what you're going to want to do is a standing twist so you can move the chair out of the way inhale reach the arms up and then you're gonna bring your arms down into this like U or goalpost position. And then exhale and twist to the side. Inhale, come back to center, reach really tall, lengthen, lengthen, lengthen. And then exhale, you can bring the arms down so the elbows and shoulders are at the same height. And then twist off to the side and come back to center. And you'll see my hands, my fingers are really spreading, doing the opposite of what I would be doing while knitting or spinning like that and then shake out the hands, okay? One last thing, and then we can get back to knitting. You take your hands, interlace your fingers, turn your palms away from you. So I'm gonna try to keep my pinky finger and thumb thumbs connected. And sometimes in order to do that, if my shoulders are feeling really tight, I keep the elbows bent. And then I just slowly inhale and reach the arms up. And you can stop here. You can see, you don't have to get the arms overhead. You can have them right here, or you can keep lifting up until your hands are right above your head. 
as long as you can keep breathing easy and you're not clenching, clenching your jaw, maybe you can start to straighten your arms up and you can even sway a little from side to side. And then just release the fingers. Shake it out one last time. Sit on down and head back to knitting. Namaste. What made you decide to write the book? Uh, I've always wanted to write a book. It's just something that has been a, an inner passion that I've always wanted uh, to do. I, uh, this is not my last. Uh, this is just my first. And um, this book, I actually started writing in 2009. Nope, 2008. 2008. Uh, I started it a long time ago, um, but I'm glad it took me this long because um, more life happened. And I think that I was able to share a lot more um, knowledge than I would have before uh, this. Um, so even though it was uh, excruciatingly long to get through, um, I'm really proud of what uh, where I ended up. Well, who was your audience? Like when you were writing this book, who was the audience you had in mind? So originally I was thinking uh, for yogis, for, um, you know, people more into yoga. And then I realized, no, it's more a knitter who might be curious about adding some yoga aspects to their life and not a knitter who necessarily wants to be able to do lots of down dogs and sun salutations, but a knitter who might be curious about adding a little meditation to her knitting or, um, you know, wants to be able to move a little bit easier after an, a long knitting session. Um, uh, and perhaps a knitter who just feels a little stressed about life in general um, and wants some stress reducers. Um, because I've found that like, all, again, all of the practices in the book, you don't have to do all of them. You just pick one and it'll be beneficial. Um, I found all of them extremely helpful when I was going through my cancer treatment, when I was um, sick recently while pregnant. Um, and it just really has helped me stay a more even keel. I mean, I still completely have my meltdown movements as anyone does. Um, but it's just, if you have things that ground you, that you do, that you absolutely love, um, it, I don't know. I think it makes, uh, things a little bit, uh, more joyful and easier. I mean, do you ever stress over knitting or over like the scheduling of it? Because you have your retreats to plan, you have your yoga to teach, you have the book to write, the three children, which, as you told me, sometimes you carry all three of them together at the same time. Yeah. I mean, all of that things, right? Do you ever stress over knitting and things not working out or like you have a design coming out and you're not on time for that? Like what stresses yeah. you in life? Yeah, I would, I, you know, right now, uh, with the Rhinebeck sheep and wool festival coming up, I have fantasies that I'll have a Rhinebeck sweater done, but I don't think it's ever going to happen. So I, I'm, I'm a little stressed about that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I see other creators, other knitters who knit so much beautiful stuff. And I feel like I, I haven't produced anything in a while. So I, I do feel that stress about that. And then I remind myself that, um, my, my children might be taking precedent. Um, you know, I need, I need to take attention to that. So, um, I do have stress about knitting sometimes, but mostly I think my stress comes from my, my children and, uh, ultimately like the knitting and the yoga fitting that in, uh, is what reduces my stress overall. Um, right. Yeah. When you come to a place like Rhinebeck, mm -hmm. is that like a shopping retreat? Is that a hanging out with uh, your friends retreat kind of feeling? Do you find inspirations for your designs? Like what what's it for you? Well, you know, usually it's just like a fun shopping thing that I do on my own. And it's, uh, you know, I find a little bit of inspiration and it's just fun to see the new yarns. But this year um, I will be doing book signings both days. So I, and I'll be teaching yoga on Sunday. Um, so I won't actually really I mean, I'll, I'm sure I'll sneak off and shop a little, but um, it, this year it feels different. Um, 
leading up to it. And that's why I, I've never actually knit a Rhinebeck sweater this year, why I feel like I should write, w- knit a Rhinebeck sweater, um, because I will be there in a professional capacity, not just um, for the joy of um, shopping and seeing friends. Um, but usually I find that with the cell network, it's hard to text. And um, usually my meetups get mixed up because of uh because of yeah. that so. there's no reception there and yeah. it's like it's really bad <laughs> yeah well people uh, can find you at the book signing so they, yes. they will know how to track you down basically yeah so i think i'll be able to see um see people easier this year hopefully <laughs> you know what i find funny like the first year i went i haven't heard of the ryan back sweater and I felt like it was totally fine. Now that like I've heard of Ryan Beck sweaters, it's becoming a pressure point. Like, oh, oh my God, like what I'm going to wear, you know? A hundred percent. And it's really funny because I, I have two that I like think, oh, I was like, I'll be there two days. Maybe I need two sweaters. But I, you know, I'm, I took me like three months to do the sleeve on this one sweater. I'm imagining it, Ryan Beck's in a month. I'm not, I might not get through the the sleeve of this cardigan. Um, and I was talking to my mom about it and she's trying to get this poncho done and she's like hurting herself rushing to get it done. And I was like, there's so much pressure just to finish your Rhinebeck sweater. So I, I'm reminding myself to take a step back and not worry. And, you know, I might show up with a uh, one sleeve unfinished if I really feel like it. <laughs> no, I think it's like, it's a good crowd to do that because they, they will understand why yeah. you're wearing unfinished sweater. They yeah. could probably totally relate to that. Yeah. Exactly. Um, when you're thinking of like what you're going to need next, is it usually like your patterns you're working on or do you like knitting other people's patterns? I like having a lot of projects going at once. So I always have a pattern idea in my head that I'm kind of tweaking or attempting. So there's always one project like that. But then I always like to knit um, somebody else's pattern just for fun it's, um, you know, it's like eating out at a restaurant, somebody else cooking for you. Um, and so, uh, the one sweater I'm working on that the sleeve might not be done for Rhinebeck is someone else's pattern. It's this color stranded knitting thing. And I absolutely am loving it. Um, but I also have alpacas, um, and I have their fiber that I'm trying to spin and knit a sweater for my husband. But I told him he's going to have to wait like 10 years for that because, um, <laughs> it's time consuming. Um, cause I, you know, I'm car, I carded the fiber, mixed it with some Merino. Um, and now I have to spin it and then eventually knit it. So, um, it's, it's a, a time- yeah, it's a heirloom project kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, you know, in the meantime, I like to have other fun projects. I've, um, you know, my daughter's five, I keep knitting her little vests and sweaters because those are a little faster. Um, so it seems like I don't finish a lot because I usually have at least seven projects going. Um, and I, I give it- let's, let's talk about that because that stresses me out. Ah, As of right now, right? I have three very secret test things that I can't say anything about it except- each one of them, well, one is sort of easy, just like time consuming, and two yep. of them are like technically difficult. Mm-hmm. And all of them have a deadline. Mm-hmm. I'm enjoying every stitch. I'm loving all of it. But it stresses me out that there's three of them and there is a deadline. Yeah. Does it ever stress you to have seven different projects? Well, no, because I don't have a deadline other than possibly Rhinebeck. If I do have a deadline, then I'm a hundred percent stressed about it. Um, and that's why I like to knit without a deadline. <laughs> uh, but like, you know, when I worked on the sweet fern hat for um for pom pom, you know, I had a deadline for that. And it was only a hat, but it was a little bit stressful to make sure that it was completed in time. And, you know, I too enjoyed every stitch, but I was like a little nervous, like, oh my God, am I going to actually finish this? So um, the number of projects doesn't stress me out as long as I don't really care that they may not be finished for like 10 years, uh, you know, and some will fi- be finished in time uh, or in a shorter amount of time. Um, so, and I've created my what I choose to knit around that, that I don't have time constraints because I know, um, 
I can't handle it. I don't like I don't like a deadline. <laughs> well, when you choose your project, right? And you mentioned you're doing stranded knitting, you're doing brioche. Like, are you gravitating toward like intricate, challenging projects, or do you prefer something meditative, like the Yogarta Stitch kind of thing? Mm. So I really I choose projects based on two things. One, can I knit it in the round? And two, is it going to be fun for me, like interesting enough? And I actually find that brioche is more meditative than any other stitch pattern. Um, the color stranded, uh, I have to like look at the chart too much for it to be that meditative uh, of a process. Um, so it's more like I pick based on, yeah, can I knit it in the round? <laughs> uh, or is it going to be um, like, make me feel creative as I'm, I'm making it. Um, that said, there are always at least once a year, I do like to pick a project that's with a really bulky yarn. Uh, that's just straight stockinette stitch. Like I recently knit, um, a top down cardigan where I wouldn't have to weave in like barely any ends. And it was just stockinette stitch, um, with a few increases and changes here and there. Um, so it's, um, I, I, that's also why I like to have so many projects, um, because it depends on my mood. Like if I, if it's my brioche cowl, I like that for my meditation, my color stranded knitting, it's keeping my mind active and it's beautiful. Uh, you know, or I just want a bulky knit I can get through, um, or, you know, creating a, a new pattern that, um, like challenges me a little bit. So. What about when it comes to your designs? Like, do you try to insert some yoga into your pattern writing? You know, I do in a way um, because I like to keep my pattern somewhat simple because I find it easier to get through the project if you're not if it's a simplified pattern and a smaller project um, and something that um, you can take a little bit of time with. Like um, one of the patterns from the book is this brioche uh, blanket, but there's only brioche on part of it mm -hmm. um, and the rest is garter stitch. So you can kind of take your time, um, you know, if brioche isn't meditative to you, uh, the, the brioche part is just a shortened part and the rest of it can be kind of like, all right, I'm going to calm myself down after that, that brioche moment. Um, but it's also that my patterns, I really like to write them based on, could I wear this while I'm practicing yoga or could I use it for a yoga practice? Like this is the meditation mat, um, or meditation shawl pattern. Um, and I have a, not in the book, but I have another pattern that's like uh, called the warrior vest. Um, and I knit it basically because I was like, I need a vest that I can wear while I practice yoga, that I can move my arms freely, um, but still wear a really fun knit. Do you ever look back and question like, what if I didn't leave that marketing job? Would it be easier like it stressed me back then, but would it be easier now than like hustling all of this uh, and juggling all these balls and like trying to make a living? Whereas like nine to five is just mentally easier because you don't have to think about like all these things. Yeah. Hmm. I do. I think about that uh, more in the sense of um, where I would be in like physically also, because, um, I was, since I left my job and I decided to be able to work anywhere in the world, really, I was able to move with my husband. We we've over the years, we've lived in, um, New York city, Boston, LA, and now we live in the Catskills. And I don't think I would have been able to do that if I had stuck with that traditional job. Um, and I think my personality, though, is even though I'm juggling a lot of balls, it works better for for me to do this rather than be stuck in a nine to five job where um, I have to. I feel like I have to had to please people a little bit too much in that job. Well, where, when it comes to knitting, 
meters open encounter um other people assuming that because they're meeting and they enjoy it anyway they should need them something do you get uh, people asking you to well you're knitting anyway you love doing it would you need me this or that yes how do you deal with that um you know i just say i knit because i love it um but i barely have any time to knit for myself um so i don't sell my sell my knits and i don't really give them as gifts which I do give them as gifts to, you know, a friend has a baby. I make a baby sweater. Um, I, I actually do have one friend who I give a lot of my finished knits to, um, because she, she loves them and I realize I'm not going to wear them so she can. Um, but I recently had that happen where someone saw my yarn wall and was asking, um, can you knit me something? And I was like, oh, well, most of this, I, you know, Took me forever to knit, so no, <laughs> it takes too long. <laughs> you know, but I say I'll them. teach you how to knit. I, I a lot of times I'll say I can teach you. We can have a session, and and uh, you know, you can make one yourself. And they're like, eh, no. <laughs> You know what I found amusing? One year, a friend of mine who was like asking me to knit her something, yeah. uh, she decided that like she's just gonna go to the yarn store and buy some yarn for me to knit something. And then she had such a price shock in that yarn store that she came back and she's like, you know what? I take it all back. I understand why, like, you would be reluctant to make me a poncho <laughs> from yeah. Kashmir, you know. <laughs> so it's like sometimes people just don't realize how mm -hmm. how long it takes, how much effort it takes, and how expensive the yarn is. Yes, especially the nice yarn. Yeah. Well, besides three alpacas, mm -hmm. you have chickens. Yes. And uh, so we have three alpacas. We have 11 chickens at the moment. The number changes a little bit with them. And we have a barn cat, a wild barn cat named, um, I think named Hunter. <laughs> uh, we had to, We had two and one disappeared. Uh, and I have a dog uh, named Cosmo. She's a little red Shiba Inu. She looks like a fox. Um, and then three little humans. Okay. So explain me how you balance it. You wake up in the morning, you have three kids under five. Yeah. You have all these farm animals. Yeah. You manage to card the wool, you manage to spin, you manage to knit, you manage to write a book and teach yoga and practice yoga. When? It's in bits and pieces. Um, it's not a very organized thing. Uh, I'm not a schedule person, um, which is funny um, because for the yoga retreats, there's always a very strict schedule that I set. But when, when it comes to my day-to-day -day life, um, there's no real schedule other than getting my five-year-old off to kindergarten. Um, but the timing, I don't know how it works, but it just does. And I do it in small snippets. Um, you know, yesterday morning, I snuck my yoga practice in at, uh, you know, 7am and my kids joined me. Um, well, the two month old slept, but you know, the other two um, uh, joined in. Um, and then, you know, we make it a family activity to feed the alpacas to check for eggs and stuff like that and luckily the animals um are a little low maintenance um and my you know my husband helps out with the heavy lifting um stuff you know uh the manure management is something that nobody really talks about when you've got big animals but <laughs> it it has to happen or and even with the chickens um and uh, Tom and I, my husband's name is Tom, we take turns uh, doing those things. Um, but, you know, he, we recently had to invest in a tractor to, to just really get some of the big stuff moved um, and things like that. So I, it helps that my husband works from home as well. So we, uh, we just kind of go throughout our day taking turns, one in charge, the others in charge, and just kind of, uh, we go with the flow um, and things uh, are chaotic, but um, come together. Do you feel like you're living a, like your dream? Uh, I would say yes, because I definitely always had dreamed of having alpacas and everything. And, you know, it's it's funny, actually, when I was younger, 
uh, you know, in my early twenties, I didn't really think about having kids. And then, um, when I got breast cancer, I was like, I want seven children. I need to have all the kids. Um, I think we're stopping <laughs> now <laughs> at three, uh, um, you know, I'm getting older and, uh, we're tired. Um, but it's, yeah, over the years, this is a dream life that my husband and I have manifested together. And um, the only way I'm able to write the book and teach and do the things that I want are from the support of him um, and uh, grandparents who are willing to watch the children when I want to do these kinds of things. Um, What do you think the second book is going to be about? How is it going to be different from the first one? Uh, I'm actually thinking it's going to dive a little bit even more into the the yoga and the knitting. And I'm kind of looking to make um, a mini series. Um, So rather than, you know, a whole 208 page, another beast of a book, because that took a while, um, I'm contemplating doing something a little bit more like smaller pamphlet sizes um, with uh, even more detailed description because there's a million more things yoga wise that I would love to share um, for knitters. And I think that it might be kind of a fun way to do it um, in kind of like a saddle stitch bound um, series of books. Right. Well, I I mean, I'll put the description of the of this uh, where this book can be purchased and all all your links uh, in the description of this video. So people can find it and get this book and read it and learn something. And I can't wait to see you at Rhinebeck. I'll, fi- I'll come to say hi. Yes, please come <laughs> say hello. Uh, yeah, I'll be there Saturday and Sunday. Um, there, the, there may be a, a baby sleeping on me for some of it. <laughs> that's, that's fine. <laughs> I've been through that. I had yeah. three of my own. <laughs> so you know. <laughs> babies are fine. I haven't had experience with alpacas, but babies are fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was so nice to get to know you a little bit better. Thank you so much for being my guest today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was great to talk to you. I'm so glad we got to chat. Thank you. Thank you.